And good afternoon. It's Thursday, Dave. It is. <laughs> Welcome to Daring Live, everybody. It's Thursday. We have every reason to be happy because it's another fantastic episode. And I hope everyone is well and safe uh, and is generally enjoying life as we go. We've got a cool show today. Um, I don't know that we have anything to talk about this as important as this right now. So I'm not even going to try. Other than I will mention two weeks from now, three weeks from now, Jonathan and myself, who you don't, uh, Jonathan, who you never see, very rarely see, but he's there. Uh, and Mrs. Janet Deering will be attending uh, Melfest out in North Carolina again. Um, we're main sponsors of the festival and have been for a long time, and we cannot wait to get back out, um, back to its normal, regularly scheduled month of April. Um, and so if anyone is out in North Carolina, please, please, please um, come over and say hey um, and check out. It's a good lineup this year. We're, we're very excited. Uh, hi, Julie. Hi, Sylvia. Dan Walsh, watching all the way from the UK. Um, but uh, yeah, welcome everybody to Deering Live. Let's uh, let's get into it a little bit. So our guest today, uh, a very well-respected performer and teacher of traditional music. His name is Adam Hurt. I'm sure many of you have heard of him before. Adam has fused several traditional old-time idioms to create his own style, a style for which he has been praised by the Washington Post, no less, as a banjo virtuoso. He's played at the Kennedy Center, he's won or placed in numerous major old-time banjo competitions, has conducted countless banjo and fiddle uh, workshops around the world, and has even been featured on the cover of the always awesome and very prestigious banjo newsletter, Beat That Washington Post. Um, <laughs> now, I went to his website today, and when you visit Adam Hurt's website, you're greeted with a statement that seems to really just sum him up, and we've had the pleasure of just chatting in the last uh, 30 minutes or so in the, in in our green room area. Um, and it says one thing, it says elegantly innovative claw hammer banjo. And I think there isn't really a statement that, that sums him up any better than that. It's exactly what he does. Uh, and we are thrilled that you're all here to experience it firsthand. Uh, his new album, uh, Back to the Earth is available now, uh, as are his previous six, uh, all of which are well worth a listen. Let's bring him in. Please welcome Mr. Adam Hurt. Thanks there so much, is. Jamie. Hey, David, great to see you both. Try to give you the best Daring Live treatment we could today. How are you? <laughs> I'm well, thanks. And it has been royal treatment indeed so far. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, we're glad to have you here. We, we're thrilled. Thank you so much for giving up your time. Now, you've had a pretty busy day teaching, I think, right? Yeah, it's been a long teaching day, but this is a great way to wind down with some conversation, banjo geeking, and music on my own terms, which is a little different from my norm. <laughs> Absolutely. And this, this episode is all about you and we want to get to know you. We want to find out about your styles. I know you've got uh, more than one banjo with you that you want to um, kind of show off a little bit today. And I'm sure we're going to get into all of those. But uh, as is tradition, you want to kick us off with a little tune? I'd love to. Thank you so uh, much. Adam, thank you so much for joining us today and we'll see you in a few minutes. All right. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. 
Wow. That beautiful, beautiful stuff. Thank you so um, much. What was the name of that tune? That's called Snowdrop. Okay. And what's the history of that tune? Snowdrop comes from Tennessee uh, historical old-time musicians and brothers Sam and Kirk McGee, who played on the Grand Ole Opry in the early days and uh, performed traditional material and some of their own material. And... Uh, uh, Kirk played in a finger style, not the claw hammer style that I'm playing uh -huh. in, but I don't really play in a finger style, and I just heard the beauty of that tune and thought, you know, maybe it can be adapted to fit the down picking style that I like. And I've been exploring it for over 20 years, and it just <laughs> keeps getting more interesting to me. Love it. Right, I love it when a, when a tune just speaks to you and you just keep kind of going back to it. It doesn't get old at all. Absolutely. I don't think this one ever will get old for me. <laughs> yeah. You're yeah. pulling and you're pulling such great tone out of your banjo. Um, Thank it, you. It's a really great playing. Thanks so um, much. Well, this is fun to have you on the show. I've been a fan of yours for a long time since uh, I think your Insight album. Oh, um, wow. That was a long time ago. Yeah. So, uh, but um, so I'm excited for this one. Um, why don't you, for people that don't know your background that much, could you just you know quickly go go over your background, how you got into banjo, why you kind of went down the the claw hammer route, um, and everything like that. Sure, sure. I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota, not exactly a hotbed of old time music, not really a hotbed of uh, bluegrass music either. There was enough of a bluegrass and old time music community up there when I was still living there to get me interested, but it was a small community. That's kind of changed since I moved away from the Twin Cities, and now it's a surprisingly happening place for being so far from the southeast. But I didn't have this music in my family, especially growing up there. It wasn't around me in the community. I happened onto it totally accidentally in elementary school when I happened to be in the homeroom of a guy named Don Payton, who was a lifelong old-time and bluegrass music enthusiast who brought his instruments into the classroom to share with his students sounds that he figured they'd never heard before. My parents were both classical musicians. My dad made his living as a violinist for the Minnesota Orchestra, and my mother was always a serious classical piano player. So I had that in my background, uh, like in the whole background of my growing up. And that was really the only music that they listened to, that we listened to at home, classical. They put me in piano lessons when I was really young. I liked it well enough, and I liked classical music well enough, but it was hard for me to make any kind of music on any kind of instrument from reading a page. And yet I didn't know there was any other way to make music until I saw my fourth grade teacher, Don, uh, playing these really compelling melodies on a variety of interesting instruments without looking at a scrap of paper, just playing what was in his head, playing what was in his heart. So the combination of the melodies and the sounds of the instruments and the way that they looked and then not having to be confined to what was on the printed page just hooked me. And uh, Don showed me some things on the mandolin first during recess periods at school. He let me borrow his classroom mandolin to take home over spring break and show my parents what I had been learning to do. Uh, they saw my interest, got me a little mandolin, got me some bluegrass mandolin lessons. And one thing kind of led to another. I found myself liking old-time fiddle tunes on that instrument more than I found myself drawn to bluegrass standards or hot solo breaks or that sort of thing. So um, I was learning mandolin from Brian Wickland, who might be a name familiar to listeners out there. He's a great player of all of the instruments, more bluegrass than anything else. But at the time, he was just starting to learn claw hammer banjo. And uh, he would sometimes play another instrument with me in the lesson while I played the mandolin, just to give me a little more context for what we were doing. And the moment he pulled out that open back banjo and started playing in this very different way than I had heard at any of the local bluegrass events my parents had taken me to, I thought, that's it. 
That's what I want to do. Forget about this mandolin. Let's leave the piano behind altogether. I just found the blend of melody and rhythm that's unique to the Clawhammer banjo style so compelling. And even though I was enjoying playing the mandolin with other people and enjoying playing it with Brian in our lessons, um, it didn't seem like the sort of thing I would get as much enjoyment out of by myself. And I knew that I didn't have endless opportunities to play bluegrass or old time music with other people because I was still a young person. I didn't have a way to get around. The music community up there was kind of small. The Clawhammer banjo seemed more self-contained in a way uh, with this driving rhythm that's like an undercurrent for everything that's played, but as much melodic detail on top of that as the player wants to put in. So it seemed in a lot of ways a better fit for the situation that I was in. And uh, I kind of got into it and never looked back. I took about a year of lessons, weekly lessons, with uh, someone Brian referred my parents to in Minneapolis, a woman named Marianne Kovach, who's a wonderful banjo player and uh, a font of knowledge about old time music. She was never into bluegrass as far as I know. And then she sent me away from those lessons with uh, a cassette recording that she had made that was like an anthology of her own, of old-time banjo from yesterday and today. This was in the mid-90s uh, today. And uh, a different player was on every track, and she basically encouraged me to listen to that, and any player whose approach spoke to me, go seek out more of that player's music, and go put myself in situations with old-time fiddlers where I'm having to follow tunes that I don't already know, and I'm having to kind of make quick sense of this stuff on the fly. And I've kind of been following her advice and her instructions ever since. It's just been a joy, and uh, this is the focus of my life in a way that I think it never would or could have been if I hadn't had that chance encounter with, with Don and his old time and bluegrass music in fourth grade. I'm so grateful for uh, the circumstances that I was in. Yeah, that's fantastic that um, you're around those people that, you know, could uh, introduce you to, the, to something at such an early age, too. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely. So, so how did you... At the top of the show, in Jamie's intro, he mentioned how you've um, how you've kind of integrated a few techniques into your own style to kind of create your own style of clawhammer playing. Would you want to talk about some of these different techniques and how you would describe your style versus sure the, the straight up traditional style? Sure. I mean, I I try to avoid labels for myself and others as much as I possibly can, but I guess if one were to put me in some kind of stylistic camp, it would be melodic claw hammer. But mm -hmm. that's not a style that I was really taught ever. When mm -hmm. Marianne was giving me that initial year of lessons, she was just kind of teaching me in a straight up sort of generic, and I don't mean that in a negative way, claw hammer style that would sound fine on its own and would fit into an old-time jam, no problem. And then I was listening to a real cross-section of clawhammer banjo approaches, but I didn't really know what was what. That was before the internet was much of a thing, and certainly before mm -hmm. YouTube. I hadn't seen that many great old-time banjo players in person. But uh, toward the end of my childhood in Minnesota, my parents took me to the Clifftop Festival in West Virginia, which is kind of old-time music mecca. It's incredible, and it's uh, the favorite thing, uh, my favorite thing in my musical life. I'm so anxious for it to get going again, hopefully later this summer. And suddenly, I wasn't the only person around doing what I did, and I could see what other players were doing to make these cool sounds. 
So I tried to absorb some different influences from those early Clifftop Festival experiences. I had a couple wonderful opportunities to have one-on-one, one-off lessons with great banjo players who happened to be passing through the Twin Cities performing at local festivals. That gave me a little bit more insight to the breadth of the Clawhammer style. But I moved south uh, as soon as I could get free of childhood and family and all that. And I've been living in the southeast ever since in a few different locales, just trying to soak up as much as I can about different approaches to this instrument and about the various regional cultures that spawned these approaches. So I like to think that even though my style has evolved in a more melodic direction than many more traditional clawhammer players would have done, um, I'm doing that from the perspective of having learned some very traditional approaches to the instrument. I found myself paying much more attention to banjo players at the beginning of my journey than to fiddlers. These days, I learn more music from fiddlers than banjo players, and I'm using uh, my awareness of the landscape of the tunings and my toolbox of techniques to catch as much melody and rhythm from the fiddle as I can do on the wrong instrument. But I think if I had started my journey focused on the fiddle or another highly melodic instrument, um... The result would have been very different. I don't think that my playing would have wound up with a particularly rhythmic core, which I like to think it has, even while I'm trying to insert all of this melodic detail all over the place. I'm trying to not sacrifice the driving rhythm of the claw hammer style and the presence of the fifth string that I found so compelling from the moment that I first heard it. So. It's really the blending of these melodic and rhythmic influences, all of which have appealed to me in different ways, that I think makes my style a little bit different from others out there and maybe a little harder to categorize, too. Mm -hmm. And do you want to to keep that rhythmic um, pulse going when the melody is pretty busy on certain songs? Do you drop... Mm -hmm. Do you have do you, do you drop out s- some of the melody notes and simplify the melody to kind of so it doesn't turn too much of a single string kind of technique sort of thing? Exactly, I sure do. I sure do, and it's not always dropping melody notes and leaving empty space. Sometimes it's dropping melody notes and filling the space in other ways, like with the fifth string or with a multi-string brush stroke rather than isolating one string. To me, those are the most powerful rhythmic devices that we have in the claw hammer style, and uh, I've got to make room for those in my arrangements. Otherwise, I might as well be flat picking. I tell my students Uh that all the time if they're bringing me things that they've kind of worked out their own way, whether from a banjo reference or a fiddle reference, and I'm not hearing an abundance of fifth string, or I'm not hearing it in a particularly organized way, or if I'm not hearing many brushes, or if it's just all eighth notes with no quarter notes at all, I tell them, you know, that doesn't sound a whole lot like clawhammer banjo to me. That sounds more like flat picking. Not that there's anything (laughs) wrong with that, but if we're going to go to the trouble of playing this funny instrument configuration with the drone string, we might as well honor where that's coming from, I think. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, One thing I've noticed in um, a a lot of um, beginning, more beginning clawhammer players is the, because you mentioned the fifth string. The fifth string is too present where the fifth mm. strings like just like that thumb how do you keep that fifth string going without it being this kind of obnoxious you know tone that's all coming across everything right that's a great question and an important point even though i want the fifth string to be present i don't want it to be like the thing that we hear because that's just going to be obnoxious so I, I teach a lot, and I love it. This couldn't be a, a more enjoyable way for me to make my living as a musician. But it's, it forces me to constantly like 
reassess my sense of how the instrument works and how the style works and find new ways of expressing how I feel about it all to different students who have different understandings of all of this. And the explanation that I've been liking lately for how to deal with the fifth string is I think of it as the heartbeat of the clawhammer banjo style always ticking along in the background in a fairly regular sort of way, just like our hearts beat in a very metronomic sort of way, but in a way that we're not super conscious of. I mean, if we were having to focus on our heartbeats all the time to make sure that the rest of our bodies were doing what they were supposed to do, that'd be an awful lot to stress out about. And thank goodness we don't have to do that. The heartbeat is just not in focus, but it's always there and it's making everything else happen. Happen. The fifth string, with a handful of exceptions, I don't think really needs to be in focus, but it should always be there just ticking along in the background, and it's the, uh, the structure that helps make everything else the right hand does, and the left hand to a certain extent does happen. That's a, that's a very good analogy that, and the way, the way you put it there. Thanks. I like that. Um, yeah, really, it kind of provides, it's not the, the backbeat, but for, provides that pulse, you know, going through. And uh, so it's nice. Um, what do you look for? What, what do you, what, how do you describe old time music? And, and as a traditional, mu as a musician who plays a lot of traditional music, how do you, how do you, get to put yourself into the music and make the music, you know, put your own artistry into the music where you're not just rehashing songs that have been played, you know, a lot and recorded a lot, but that has a real feel of, of yourself into it. This is a yeah. conversation I've had with a lot of, you know, traditional musicians versus uh, people writing a lot of original music sort of thing. So th right. This <laughs> And it's a really interesting conversation to have because, yeah, this is old music in a way, in a lot of ways, but does that mean that it can't or shouldn't evolve or allow room for an individual musician's creativity to come into play? I don't think that's the way that it needs to be at all. To me, old-time music is... And this might be a narrower view than some people have. This is just my current version of reality. Old time music is fiddle focused music, more for dancing than any other purpose, but not specifically for dancing. Also for other forms of socializing and for reflection. There's this whole body of really crooked old time fiddle music, rhythmically and structurally quite irregular that wouldn't work for dancing and often isn't even played at a very fast tempo. And to me, that's music for reflection on the part of the individual musician making it. So, in that context, the banjo doesn't have to be a part of the music for it to be old time. I really think of it as fiddle-centric. Of course, there are a lot of great old banjo recordings that don't have fiddle on them at all, and that's old time music too. But to me, those banjo players were still informed in some way by fiddlers they may have played with or may have heard play. I feel like the the fiddle and the claw hammer banjo are best musical friends and really always have been. But now does that mean that we just have to play this music the way that it was played on those old recordings and never move forward from there? I don't think so. Does it mean that we should uh, try to just push the envelope and transport this music into the present and into the future without regard to what has happened in the genre already? I don't think that's a great plan either. I think it's important for any old-time musician playing today and learning today, regardless of their taste, to have an understanding of how the historical players did what they did maybe make a study of it, find some 
old recordings that really captivate you, either the the style in which the instrument was played is interesting or the tune being played is interesting or whatever, and challenge yourself to figure out, as close as you can come, how that player did whatever they were doing. And then, don't stop there. Decide once you have that context, okay, what can I add to that that brings something of myself into the mix but doesn't totally ignore what I've just puzzled out that the old player did? I think there are some beautiful, very personal styles being played in the old-time banjo community today. I could name a whole bunch of favorite amazing players who all sound like themselves. They don't sound like they're slavishly reproducing somebody who recorded generations ago. But I think part of what makes players like these special and what makes their personal style successful is that understanding of the more traditional approaches. They haven't just leapt straight into defining their own style and sound. They've done so with this, um, this influence from the past. I like to think that's what I've done. I've certainly listened to a lot of those old recordings, and I've made a study of really learning some of that material as close as I can come to the way I think the old players were doing it. Sometimes I like to perform or teach the music just that way. It's a real challenge to do it, and I admire the, I might call them reproductionists, who do that and just that and do it really well. It's hard. It's hard to channel anybody else and uh, sort of silence oneself in the process. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's good or bad to do that. It's hard to do that. Uh, but I, I like for there to be room for oneself, too. Let's talk about tune composition as an example of this same stuff. All of the tunes in the old-time repertoire were new at one time. Who knows which ones are newer and which ones are older unless we can really put our finger on this person composed that tune back in 1935 or whatever. Uh, but there's some great modern players who specialize in writing original tunes. I don't do that, but I admire those who do and who do it well. And by do it well, I mean they're managing to write tunes that don't come across as overtly modern. If I just hear these melodies, I think, oh, those are old-time tunes that I haven't heard before. Cool. I want to learn them. Not, oh, that's a modern tune. Right. There's a difference. I think there are some modern tunes and modern tune smiths that sound overtly contemporary. That's fine, too, if that's one's taste. But the ones that I think are the most exciting are those who are creating music that could be mistaken for something really antique. Right, right. And uh, I think that also is really hard to do. Let's think back to some of these historical players. Uh, a couple of my favorite historical banjo players are Kyle Creed and Tommy Jarrell, both from the Round Peak community of North Carolina. Amazing musicians. And they've informed, like, generations of contemporary players on both instruments. Kyle was better known as a banjo player, but he was a great fiddler too. Tommy was a lot better known as a fiddler, and his syncopated bowing style has really influenced like generation after generation of players, and it still does. But he was a really interesting banjo player. I'm coming to love his style more and more as I listen more intently to his recordings. Players like those in my view, are special because they came up with their own way of doing things. They weren't slavishly reproducing anybody else. I mean, maybe they had learned to, hard to say, but they had gone on to develop personal styles and sound like themselves. And I think it's a shame when the old-time police say, 
well, that doesn't sound traditional enough. You, you need to play it more like the original recordings. Yeah, that's worthwhile, but the people on the original recordings weren't playing it just like their sources either. Probably, best we can tell. I'd be shocked if they were. <laughs> so, yeah, I think we can honor, honor the old while making new if we're thoughtful about it. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Um, we have a question. I want to hear you play a tune, um, another tune, but we do have a question on topic with uh, from Chris Harlan. He says, does Adam hear a connection between old-time fiddle music and minstrel music? If so, how? Boy, I wish I could answer that question definitively. To be honest, I have not made a study of minstrel music uh, on the banjo or on any other instrument, uh, I do know that there are like mechanical connections between banjo styles that were in vogue during that period and the claw hammer style of today. So seems like something I could learn more about, but I just haven't. I'm sorry, Chris. I wish I could be uh, a little more fulfilling there, but you'll have to ask more of a scholar of mid 19th century music, I'm afraid. Okay, well, uh, let's hear you. Let's hear you play something. And, and what, uh, this banjo is a shorter scale banjo that you have. Sure thing. Yeah. Uh, let me get it back in tune, and I'd love to show it off to folks. This is my favorite banjo of all, and I'm really excited to have it back in action again. This is a Henry Dobson silver bell banjo made in New York wow. in the early 1880s. And it has the original silver bell Dobson tone ring that so many modern makers are using. I noticed just the other day that Deering made something with a Dobson tone ring, which was news to me and pretty exciting. I was glad to see that in the, the lineup. Uh, I love this instrument so much. It's hard to find a banjo from this period that's really super viable for hard modern play that intonates well, that's loud enough, that's clear enough, that's durable enough, that can take steel strings, and this one just does. I've had it almost 20 years, and maybe six or seven years ago, it started developing a bunch of problems. The neck had pulled forward. It had already pulled forward when I first got it, and either the problem had gotten worse or I became less tolerant of it over the years. I don't quite know, but it was just hard to play. It was still intonating well, but hard to play, and the bridge was too low to compensate for the neck being pulled forward, so it was very quiet. And I just found myself not playing it very much. And then, while I wasn't playing it and handling it, this blue-green algae-looking stuff started overtaking all of the metal parts. And it first looked kind of interesting, kind of picturesque, and then it became <laughs> a little more bothersome as it just spread. And I didn't know what to do about it, so I just put it in case for a while and tried to pretend this wasn't happening to my favorite banjo. But then uh, the year before the pandemic, I decided, you know, I miss this banjo so much and I need to get this addressed. It's too good a banjo to leave locked away and I don't want these problems to become irreparable at some right. point. So uh, I worked with the wonderful luthier from Vermont, Will Cedars Mosheim, on oh, yeah. a comprehensive restoration plan. And it took him quite a while to zero in on what he thought would be best for the instrument. And I loved his ideas. He had the banjo in his shop for two years, working on the plan and then carrying out the actual restoration. And I just got it back from him last summer. And it couldn't have turned out better. Uh, it's more comfortable to play than some of my modern banjos, which is kind of amazing. It's louder than it used to be, which makes it more useful to me if I'm playing with other people, but the character of the tone hasn't changed, and I was worried that it might right. with the geometry yeah. changing. He replaced the head. It had a really old head on it that had outlived its usefulness, but he measured with a micrometer the thickness of the old head, and he found one that matched and that had a similar proportion of 
like transparent spots to uh -huh. non-transparent spots. It sounds shockingly like the old head and it cool. looks like it too. He hand cleaned all of that algae without polishing because I didn't want the plating to be disturbed. I didn't want the patina yeah. of 140 years to go away. And it's just magnificent. It's clean, but it's not made new. He fixed a variety of other problems that had developed over the years, and uh, ever since I got it back from him, it's kind of been my main banjo, the way that it used to be before I was faced with so many challenges. It's got a 25 and a half inch scale, which I think is kind of unusual for an antique banjo. I feel like 25 and a half inch is more what has become popular in the past 20 or 30 years, right. maybe, among the modern makers. But this has that same scale length, and so I've always strung it with light strings, and I almost always leave it tuned up to the higher keys, straight up to A or D, mm -hmm. rather than down at G or C and capoing up. And that makes for a wonderful response and a clearer tone than I've been able to get from any capoed banjo. So it just works for me so well, and I'm really grateful to Will for bringing it back to life. So let me play one of my favorite tunes on it in a special tuning. This is an alternate G tuning that I learned years ago as the Sandy River Bell tuning. It's G, E, A, D, E, and it doesn't sound anything like G on the open no. strings. But when you close some of them, it turns into G. This is Big Sayote, which is a pretty commonly played tune, but it's another one like that snowdrop that I've been playing forever and I just fall in love with again and again and keep finding new things to enjoy within. It's also the tune that taught me more about the landscape of this funny tuning than any other. So it goes a little something like this.
Fantastic. I Thank played that you. tune. Is that the standard tuning to play Big Sioti in? Because I've always played it out of just open G. Right. I would say open G is the standard tuning to play okay. it in. Uh, I don't know that I had heard anyone play it in this tuning before I figured out how it could work here. But this tuning is so good for beautiful chord voicings that are also pretty easy to get to. And the chord progression of that tune, I think, is so lovely. It just seemed like a yeah. nice fit to me years ago, and I've never looked back. <laughs> and what was, that, what was the tuning again? It was E on the high string and... Yeah, from first to fifth, E, D, A, E, G. So gotcha. it's like A modal on the full length strings, but G on the fifth string. It's a little odd. I would love to hear what a bluegrass banjo player could do in this tuning. I, any bluegrass players out there listening, try it out and let me know what you come up with. I'll check it out myself because I, yeah. I do both. And, uh... Yeah, I'll definitely check that out. Good. Keep what me are posted. Some, sticking on tunings for a little bit, what are some other alternate tunings that you kind of fall back on regularly? I use this one a whole lot, and I use it for multiple keys as well. I use it for G, as in the last example. I use it maybe not surprisingly for E minor, relative minor. There's not a whole lot of old-time repertoire that goes in E minor, but there's some, and of course there's plenty of other kinds of music in E minor. I think this is the nicest sounding way to play in E minor because it's mostly open strings. And depending on the tune, this tuning with the G on the fifth string can also work for some A modal material. So it's a little unusual in the claw hammer world to have one tuning that works across multiple keys. But beyond that, I use the double C and double D tuning a whole lot. That's what the first example was in. That was down in double C. I use the A modal tuning a bit, which is this tuning, but with an A on the fifth string. A, E, A, D, E from fifth to first. I use a Cumberland gap tuning, which is a little bit like this in layout, but not quite the same. If it were pitched in the key of D, which is a little low and floppy for my banjos and my string gauges, it'd be F sharp on the fifth string, and then B, E, A, D, tuned in fourths, kind of like guitar land. Mm -hmm. um, I usually tune that tuning up a whole step, and the pitches are a little tricky to remember up there. It comes out in right. E, but the tension is a little bit better. I use that selectively. Um, there are probably like half a dozen other tunings that I use for yeah. just a couple of tunes, that sort of right. thing. That's typical of right. the old time tuning landscape. And then I use like the bluegrass G tuning tuned up to A for the vast majority of what I play that's really in the key of A, that old time fiddlers would play yeah. in A. I don't really use that tuning tuned down to G, though I use this yeah. one for material that's really in G instead, because I like the sound of this so much better, and mm -hmm. I kind of like the idea of having a totally different tuning layout for keys that on the fiddle work totally differently from each other. So uh, why shouldn't we uh, consider honoring that on the other instruments too, rather than using just the same tuning down a step or up a step? And do you learn uh, your chord shapes in these different tunings as well? So especially if you're playing in a group situation where you may not be playing melody the whole time, you might be playing some chord shapes. Absolutely. I think it's always a great way of orienting oneself to an unfamiliar tuning to just work out like the basic one, four, five, and relative right. minor in that tuning, and maybe a couple different voicings for each of those, depending on how uh -huh. far up a player wants to go. Yes, I absolutely do. And even though in old time music situations, the claw hammer banjo isn't often thrust into that sort of role, they're usually playing melody along with the fiddle. 
Um, I love to incorporate brushed chords into my melodies, whether I'm playing by myself, especially when I'm playing by myself, mm -hmm. but even if I'm playing with a fiddler or in a group, because I think they sound lovely and they add a little bit more rhythm and break up yeah. all of those eighth notes like we were talking about earlier. But I also love to play claw hammer banjo like with singers or in rather mm -hmm. different musical contexts where, yeah, I am having to take an accompaniment role a lot of the mm -hmm. time. And it's great to not have to work out chord shapes and accompaniment patterns from scratch because I'm never asked to do that in old time music. So no, anybody out there who wants to get more comfortable with alternate tunings, I'd say start with the chords and then build melodies rather yeah. than the other way around. And since you brought up playing behind singers, um, that do you have certain techniques? Let's say it's just you and and a singer songwriter, some you know vocalist or something. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have certain techniques of playing, getting the chords through there, and also getting some you know some sort of uh, more single note, not just kind of a you know bump that he brush you know chord thing, but something to really kind of make it interesting. Totally, totally. Uh, I play with syncopated space in that environment a whole lot. And in the claw hammer style, in order to not disrupt this regular down, up, down, up motion mm -hmm. of the right hand, um, our ability to syncopate is a little bit limited, not totally limited, but a little bit more than if we were playing with a, a pick. Um, but I experiment to the extent that this regular motion allows with uh, opening up a space on different beats, like each time a new phrase comes around, so that it doesn't sound like, yeah, I've come up with a syncopated motif and I'm doing the same rhythm over and over again, maybe over different chord changes. I think that's boring. And it's not that I think we shouldn't like syncopate at all or open up space, but I don't think we should get stuck in any one pattern box when we're doing right. accompaniment because it's just not going to sound all that artful behind a singer who's going probably all over the place. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that the banjo is going to be complex and stepping on the singer's toes. I don't want to do that. But the banjo is going to be creating a varied texture rather than kind of a static one. So I'm moving yeah. the syncopated space to different beats. I'm also experimenting with the beats on which I'm brushing chords versus isolating notes. And it would be so tempting to do that sort of thing, the claw hammer analog to the guitar stride, mm -hmm. you right, know? Right. But sometimes a downbeat brush adds emphasis just where the song needs it, especially if the chord has just changed. sort of thing. So yeah. I'm always thinking about these elements of the two hands that I can shift around without disrupting this flow and without sounding like I'm playing melody and trying to take attention away from the singer. It's really fun. Uh, I wish I had even more opportunities to accompany singers. I think the claw hammer banjo is a beautiful counterpoint to singing. Definitely, definitely. Those are great tips. Um, we've got a number of questions starting to come in, so I want to get to them. Um, sure. Let's see. Long, Long Neck Music is saying, I'm assuming that the first banjo you played is a tuba phone. Is ah, that correct? And then yes. what stage strings do you use on that one? Let me show that off for the camera. I didn't do that earlier. I love this banjo too, even though it's really different from the Dobson banjo. This is a tubophone conversion. The rim is from about 1915. Uh, it's a 10 and 3 quarters rather than the 10 and 15 sixteenths that's common among Vega rims. And the neck is from, I think, the early 80s. It was made by an Ohio luthier named Greg Gefell. And it's decorated a lot like the early tuba phones were done. It's got a beautiful heel carving as well. But the quality is actually better than any of the original tuba phone necks. The quality of bill, the quality of decoration for whatever that's worth. It also has quite a robust neck for a Vega style banjo. It's wide this way. It's kind of deep this way as well. I found it a little hard to play when I first 
acquired it because of that, but I've come to really appreciate what that mass does for sweetening the tone. It doesn't have that strident quality that a lot of tubaphone banjos have. It's really sweet and warm, and I like it a whole lot. Um, I use light gauge strings on all of my steel strung banjos, and I use the same sets depending on which ones I ha happen to have around. I endorse D'Addario strings, and I like their standard light gauge set with the phosphor bronze wound fourth string a whole lot, but I'm also really digging this newer line that they call the XT line of coated strings, and they figured out a way to coat even the unwound strings. And I had been curious about coated strings long ago when Elixir kind of came out mm -hmm. with the idea, but at that time, the coating was just on the wound strings, and it didn't seem like a good value for a banjo player with just the single <laughs> wound string. I have chemistry that tarnishes strings quite quickly, and these XT strings from D'Addario really do a good job of lasting longer than the uncoated kind and sounding great the whole time. So I use a combination of those two D'Addario varieties, depending on okay. what is on hand. <laughs> And a quick one, bouncing back to that other banjo you had from uh -huh. Scott Cooper. He's asking, is the fifth string on that instrument at the seventh fret? It is, and that's one of many quirks of this banjo. All of the Henry Dobson banjos that I've seen had the fifth string at least a little bit higher than usual, and sometimes it was just the nut that was like on the other side of the fifth fret from where it would typically be, but sometimes the whole tuner unit was up high. This slot head design with the slotted peg head and a similar arrangement for the fifth string is rare. Uh, but I just love it. I love the way the original gears work. It's nice to not have to swap those out and still get reasonably refined tuning. And because this fifth tuner arrangement takes up more space than a conventional tuner would have yeah, done, yeah. Um, they just move the whole thing farther out of the way. If I were wanting to fret the fifth string, it wouldn't work out, but I never fret my fifth string. Not a lot of claw hammer players do, like the bluegrass players tend to do. Uh, and that just puts it wonderfully out of the way of my left hand. Uh, yeah. If I were using a capo, which I don't, and this were down in the usual location, there'd be like no room for my thumb. Mm -hmm. So not using a capo and this being way up high just gives me so much freedom to move and not have to circumvent the tuner. But it did take a lot of getting used to when I first got the banjo. I kept jumping up to the fret in line with the tuner, right. expecting yep. it to be the fifth fret and I was two oh, frets right. off. Yeah. When I pick up long neck banjos, because it's like that. And Same I, difference. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Very disorienting. <laughs> yeah. Um, Julie Colton is, has a question about this banjo. She's wondering, do, do you have any stories about this banjo's history? Sure. Hey, Julie. Great to hear from you over in the UK. Uh, yes, my banjo hero, one of many banjo heroes, but this is a particularly special one, Reed Martin, fantastic clawhammer banjo player, for those of you who haven't heard his music, and his solo CD actually just got reissued late last year or early this year. You should all buy it now. It was out of print for a long time, and it's dazzling. Um, when I first met Reed Martin, I had just finished recording my Inside album in the D.C. area. Kathy Fink and Marcy Markser, my dear friends, produced that album, and I was working on it there with them. They knew that I loved Reed Martin's music, and they were good friends with him, so they invited him over to just visit. And I was super excited to meet my hero. He came in. He lived not far away. He shook hands took one look at this banjo sitting in the corner and said, that used to be my banjo. And wow. it did, sure enough. I got to asking him more about it. It has a very distinctive look, so uh, he knew what he was seeing and what he was talking about. He had found this banjo when he was living in Boston. It was in a junk shop on the north side, he said, and he got it in about 1968. And it had this a uh, rather similar looking kind of mottled skin on it at the time that he recognized. So the head that Will 
cedars Mosheim took off had been on there since at least the 60s, maybe longer. And I still have it. It's in my archive. It just wasn't working so well on the banjo anymore. But uh, <laughs> Reed told me that he had put it back together and he had used it as his player for a while. And he also did some repair to it. Uh, one example of which is the inlay at the last fret here before the brass plate. <laughs> he said he filled that using Elmer's glue. And I had always thought, you know, that's kind of ugly. Maybe I should have that cleaned up. But once I heard that story, I decided, no, I'm never going to change that. And I asked Will to please not change that. That's the Reed Martin repair. That's got Reed Martin's mojo all over it. Uh, and he didn't quite remember what had happened to it, but he had let go of the banjo at some point, And it had passed through at least two other owners' hands before I got it. I traded a fretless banjo for it that I didn't have a whole lot of money into and that was really not useful to me. And Bob Thornburg, the gourd banjo maker out in California, had this. I heard that he had it. And it wasn't doing him a whole lot of good, so we sent each other the banjos. We both loved what the other had sent, and we traded straight across. <laughs> that's a great story. That's, that's, that's wild. <laughs> Love it. Thank you. Um, some more questions. We have one from uh, Gigito. Um, hi, Adam. How do you perceive the development of the claw hammer style and its aesthetic? Do you think that for the most part, the style is still very much on the old time music spectrum? That's a really cool question. I do think we're uh, seeing more personal approaches to the style than ever before. And like we were talking earlier, David, I'm not sure that it has to do with the music wasn't evolving much or at all earlier in its history, and now it's just starting to evolve more. I'm not sure that's it. I think it's always evolved, but now we have so many more ways of accessing the music right. and learning from other people, even if we're not doing it in a super interactive way, that wouldn't have been possible even just a generation or two ago. So I think that's contributing to the prevalence of personal styles, more innovative styles, if you want, within the old-time banjo community. And I think that's pretty exciting. I just hope that the music that results will still sound and feel to me like old-time music and not like something else. There are clawhammer banjo players applying this style to other genres of music, and that's really cool, too. I think of that as a separate thing. Mm -hmm. But um, old-time banjo, I think, it is at a very exciting moment right now, and uh, I can't wait to see and hear the scope of the music once the festivals really get cranking again. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have a question from Hobart Wright. He's saying, "Does Adam strike? Does Adam down strike with two fingers or just one?" Mainly just one. I grow out both of these fingernails. I like the precision and the tone that I get better with my index fingernail than with my middle. But when I'm working with students who have learned to play in other places, if they come playing with the middle or with a combination of the two and it's working well, we don't change that. There are a lot of great players who just use the middle or who use a combination of the two. But if I break this one, I've got a spare waiting for me that works okay. It's not brilliant, but it's better than no nail at all. Uh, so when I'm picking out individual strings, it's this one. But when I'm brushing across multiple strings, it's n these two and the others. I let them trail along for the ride, which I think is a little bit unorthodox. And to my ear, it makes for a little more complex texture across multiple strings because the fingers are all hitting at slightly different rhythmic points. And when you're doing that, um, it's almost like a Spanish guitar sort of style. Um, is the, the ring and the pinky coming after the index in the, in the middle? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, that, that nail thing, uh, I do the same. I have like the backup nail, you know, if one goes, so you, <laughs> kind of, you have the, the other one, or if it wears down, if you're playing too hard or something. Right. Never a bad thing to have a spare. Right. 
because that takes away another question I was going to ask you. You know, do you use the fake fingernail thing, or, or do you just natural nails, or what? I'm really lucky to have pretty good natural nails. I mean, they're very pliable. They're not super thick like some players' nails I've seen up close, and they do break occasionally. But they don't split just right and left. They don't flake off. They don't really wear down. And I've developed a touch that I think is a little easier on my nails than mm -hmm. what I've seen some people do. If I were striking the strings in a different way, they might wear down a little bit more than they do. Mm -hmm. um, here's a question from from Save Marinwood. It says, Adam has a unique melodic style that he plays with great sensitivity. When he first started on his own path, was it difficult to find other musicians to work with this style? Hmm. That's an interesting question and an interesting way to put it. I feel like when I was really starting to develop my style in a purposeful way, I was mostly doing that on my own, not really having an opportunity to interface it with other musicians, and not really having a desire to do that either. I was just trying to learn about this instrument every way I could on my own, and uh, figure out sounds and approaches that sound and felt good to me. And then, uh, as I vacillated between solo practice and play and solo development of a style and making music with others, uh, I just try to suss out the tastes of the musicians that I'm playing with and decide, well, is this a good environment for my real personal style? Or is a more traditional vibe going to fit in better with these old-time musicians, or what? So I like to think that while when I play by myself or I play banjo in the lead with guitar accompaniment, which I do quite a bit of, uh, I can really shape my sound any way I want to. When I'm playing in a more traditional old-time context with the other instruments, and especially with fiddlers, I'm trying to not force my style and sound down everybody's throat. I'm just trying to find a way to fit in there and lighting at various places along a very melodic to a very rhythmic spectrum, depending on the kind of input, musical and otherwise, that I'm getting from my playmates, rather than just playing one way all the time. Right. Yeah. That's good. Um, let's see. We have another question from Colby Bunton. And he says, as a relatively new clawmer, claw hammer banjo player who doesn't know many other musicians in my area to play with, re what recommendations do you have for finding fellow players to jam and grow with? You know, Facebook, if you're into Facebook, Colby, I think is an amazing resource for the banjo community and the old time community overall. There are all of these groups that have shockingly large readership. Uh, for banjo specifically, there's the Clawhammer Rules group and Clawhammer for Life, and they've got huge viewerships. You could just post something on there and say exactly what you did there say a little something about your location. You don't have to be super specific if that feels sketchy. And you'll probably have people chiming in like, oh, well, I'm sort of near there, or I know somebody who's sort of near there, or check out this resource. There's a jam group sort of near there, that sort of thing. If you're looking for old time music more generally, there's the dedicated to old time music group on Facebook that's colossal. Another resource like that, but not on Facebook, is the Banjo Hangout discussion forum. It's not nearly as active as it used to be, in part because these Facebook groups have come along, but it's still got huge numbers of members. And I don't know about anyone else, but I visit there frequently. I hardly ever post. I like to lurk, but I'm always enjoying seeing <laughs> what people are talking about. So you could start... Uh, a thread there with the same sort of request and people will chime in. They really will. I think you can find your your crowd if you do a little bit of internet sleuthing. <laughs> Good info. Um, this is Jeff Smith is saying, Hi Adam, could you talk a little bit about what you're looking for tonally with the towel you place in the banjo? Hey Jeff, good to hear from you. Yeah, 
the towel thing, the stuffing thing is a polarizing issue among old time <laughs> banjo players. But here's what I finally realized about it. I knew that I like stuffing in my banjos. I don't like the overtones that come out of an unstuffed banjo. And I thought, well, part of that is because I play in a melodic style and the note density is such that I need to minimize overtones and echo any way that I can to keep it from sounding like a mess. But then I thought, hmm, bluegrass banjo players play in a super dense style all the time. They have the resonator, which kind of amplifies everything, including overtones, and I've never known a single one to stuff their banjo, so what gives? And then it occurred to me, bluegrass banjo players are posting their fingers on the head as they play, and that's doing for the overtones very much what the stuffing is doing here. And I think if claw hammer players could play somehow with posted fingers, there might be a whole lot less stuffing going on. And I am pretty darn sure that if bluegrass players played with a floating hand the way that we do, every last one of them would be stuffing their banjos and probably a whole lot more than the old time crowd does. <laughs> so that's kind of the way that I've come to terms with it being okay. It's not just that it's my sonic preference, it's uh, a reaction to the mechanics of the right hand style and how the instrument itself kind of deals with those mechanics. I'm not trying to cut down on volume, I'm just trying to get a focus on the notes that I'm actually playing and not the ambient ringing of the rest of the instrument. Right, right. Um... Let's see. We have one more question. Then I then want to um, we run over the hour a little bit, and then ask you to play one more tune, play us out. But um, sure. Uh, but Matt Matt Searless says, how frequently does Adam adjust the head tension on his banjos? Hey Matt, great to hear from you too. You know, I hate messing with my banjos. I like to pick them up and have them ready to go. I have a number of different banjos that are all like different lengths and the bridges are all a little bit different heights. So I'm lucky in that I haven't gotten conditioned to one sound and feel and only one sound and feel. I can tolerate a range of sounds and feels. I use these natural skins. I love that sound. I love that combination of warmth and clarity that I have not found in any synthetic head. But if I were having to constantly adjust the tension, I'd probably just swallow my pride and put on a frosted head. I think the frosted heads are actually the best sounding synthetic heads for claw hammer style. They're a little bright, but they're really clear. And I think if mm -hmm. you can only have one of those qualities, that's the more important one to have. But um, these skins, if they're mounted right, on the flesh hoop in the first place, if that's done properly, they're more stable than a lot of people have been led to believe. I mm. think a lot of what we hear about how skins just move around like crazy is kind of a lot of hype because that just hasn't been my experience. I might have to tighten my heads, I don't know, a couple of times as I enter the humid summer season. I live in Southern Virginia and it's pretty darn humid here in the warm months. And then correspondingly, when the heat comes on in the house in September, maybe, or early October, the heads start to dry up and tense up, and I might have to loosen them a couple of times. And I'm not even making those adjustments because the banjos are unplayable without them, or I'm worried that the heads are gonna split. It's more to keep them sounding their very best and to keep them playing in a really nice, way. And beyond that, I just kind of let them do their thing. And they are moving around all the time, but for my tolerance, not enough to require constant adjustments that would just drive me up the wall. So don't be scared of hide heads. 
if you can find someone to mount them really well or if you can get a, a pre-mounted skin from John Balch, he does a great job of mounting them the right way. You can install mm -hmm. those on your banjo and be pretty assured of more stability than you might have been led to believe you can get in a natural skin. It's not going to be as stable as plastic, but that's the sacrifice you make for tone. And for me, it's a very small sacrifice. All right. Well, well, um, this has been fantastic. I have a, personally have a lot more questions, so <laughs> we got to have you have you back on sometime, and so we oh, can get thank to them. You. Um, it's been great, and uh, and all the chat. I know our viewers have enjoyed it a lot too. Um, I'd like to for you to play again, but I know you have this this very interesting banjo in your hand. So before you play, if you could talk a little bit about this banjo, it has these like the two heads on it almost, right? Right, right. And uh, another yeah. favorite banjo, and uh, I'm so lucky to get to play this thing and share it with folks. This is a gourd banjo, fretless, simple fingerboard, friction pegs like violin family instruments, and these fascinating uh, double sound chambers. That's how it looks from the side. This banjo was made by David Hyatt from Arkansas. And as I understand it, this gourd was grown between boards so that it couldn't get big and round and pumpkin-like in the back. Uh -huh. And that makes it a whole lot easier to hold and play. Those round gourds just move around in my lap mm -hmm. all the time. They're impossible. And it makes for a louder, clearer, better sound. It's still mm -hmm. a very dark sounding instrument compared to the conventional banjos, but it has a focused quality that I've not found in any other gourd. And I think it has to do a lot with uh, the flat back. I don't know how much this second sound chamber affects the sound. I've never heard it without the second sound chamber. <laughs> it's got to figure in somewhere, but I think yeah. this is maybe the more important element. Uh, I just love it. This is a modern instrument. It's David's own design, David Hyatt's own design, but it's uh, meant to sort of reimagine the very earliest American banjos and the West African ancestors of the modern banjo, which are still being made over there in ways not unlike this. And I think this is so cool, sometimes being played in ways that look an awful lot like claw hammer. It's just not that different a thing. Yeah. So um, I just love it. And I use this uh, just before the pandemic. My last studio date was like two weeks before everything shut down to make a new album called Back to the Earth, my second Gord Banjo album. Uh, all of the mixing and whatnot happened remotely, and I'm so glad everything played out the way that it did. Otherwise... I don't think I would have been able to make the album happen. There were a lot of moving parts, but uh, I think this banjo came out sounding beautiful on the album. My engineers just did a bang-up job capturing its magic, and uh, it's one of my favorite things to play. So excited to share it with you all here. And uh, are we going to close on this musical note? Should I say goodbye before I play? We are going to close on it. Also, let us know what tune you're going to play as well. Okay, sure will. Thank you, David, for having me on. Thank you to Jamie, who was here earlier. Thanks, Jonathan, for the great tech support. This has been super, super fun. And uh, I'd be honored to do it again if you have many repeat guests. So thank you for all of that. And I know this is a, a Deering event, so I want to take a moment to thank Deering for the many ways that you've supported the banjo community over the years, but especially during these weird times of the past couple years. I'm personally really grateful to Deering for helping make the online old-time banjo contest happen, which has been a really fun event of the past two years. All the videos for both contests can still be found on Facebook. The finals can still be seen on YouTube. That couldn't have happened without Deering. So thank you so much. You're very welcome.
All right, I'm going to play a tune from the new album called Bowback. I learned this from the fingerstyle banjo playing of my friend Chris Turpin, who's from Georgia, and this is a tune that comes from Georgia as well. I think it's super moody and spooky, and I love it, and I hope you all will too. Thank you again for, for having me, and thanks to those in internet land for tuning in. Thank you. 